from New York. This is The Close-Up, conversations with creative people, made possible by Barco. Here's Jim Chabin. We're broadcasting tonight from Sotheby's Art Auction House here in New York City. It's in this building that priceless works of art have been auctioned off to bidders located here and around the world for decades. We're here because Sotheby's has opened its world-famous galleries and invited artists and technicians active in virtual reality to come display their work and share their insights and conversations for two days. One of our conversations was with New York native and prolific Hollywood filmmaker, Doug Lyman. His films include Swingers, Go, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, The Born Identity, and Tom Cruise's Edge of Tomorrow. His next film is Chaos Walking, starring Spider-Man's Tom Holland and Daisy Ridley. Most recently, Mr. Lyman has created the six-part VR series, Invisible, with Condé Nast Entertainment. Please welcome Doug Lyman. How much of your time do you spend in New York versus Los Angeles? Uh, I mean, New York is home, and I try to edit my projects here. So I tend not to shoot in New York. Um, because the kinds of movies I make. So um, you and Marty Scorsese and Ang Lee all kind of like to do their work here. Well, I love New York. What was your aha moment for VR? When was your moment where you said, okay, I'll lend my talent to this? Uh, you know, I think I've always been interested in, in new technology and, and new forms of, of storytelling. So um, when people started putting uh, content on the Internet, I started thinking, well, maybe, you know, there could be, um, could there be nonlinear storytelling op opportunities? Uh, you know, I've always, uh, even within my films, sort of challenged, I mean, VR is such a, a tectonic shift that the kinds of things I was challenging um, in my motion pictures seem trite in, in comparison of, like, breaking the rules of when you cross the line and all these things they teach you in film school. And so it was sort of only a matter of time before... Um, I would stumble across VR and go, this is, this technology actually, like color film, uh, could enable us to uh, tell stories in, in, in new ways, um, in more effective ways. You and your friend John Favreau made Swingers. John went on to direct Jungle Book last year and um, uh, the Iron Man series and many, many other projects was a recurring role on Seinfeld and an actor. Uh, when you're in that period of making a movie, do you ever have a sense that, do you have a moment where you say, this is gonna be really, really good? It's, I do, maybe not on Swingers, because you know it was my first film and, and we had people on the set constantly disparaging us. I mean, people working on our own movie, like our sound guy saying, <laughs> you know, you guys are working so hard, you really, it's cute and all, but no one's gonna see this movie. <laughs> this is your crew. This is my sound guy telling us this, you know, cause he's like, you know, relax a little bit, stop working so hard. Um, and, uh, but there was an aha moment on Swingers at the end of the first week, cause I really broke an insane amount of rules to get that movie made, cause we had no money. Um, in fact, I had shot something in film school, uh, a little sequence with a, a rat and a cat that violated all of these rules they taught us at USC. I mean, all of them. And it came out great. And I, uh, it was the title sequence for this film I made called Getting In when I was in film school. And so when I was setting out to make Swingers, I uh, was talking to Favreau and Vince Vaughn about it. And I said, look, I'm gonna show you this sequence I shot with a rat and a cat, and I'm ready to try it with human beings. And it sounds like a joke, but I was really serious. I was like, look how fun it came out. And this is a three minute sequence. It cost me $500 in 35 millimeter. And I wanted to apply this to a whole feature film. And, and that's how we made Swingers. And so at the end of the first week, I got my dailies back and I saw um, footage from the first day. Because you know, you shoot on film, you actually don't know what you're gonna get till it comes back from the lab. It could be out of focus, it could be dark, it could just be unwatchable. And, and so I do remember that at uh, the end of the first week, seeing footage from the first day and sort of crying, literally crying and going like, this, this might actually work. The rules for VR a year ago or a year and a half ago were don't move the camera, don't cut too much, keep the camera 
at body height or head height. You're just talking about breaking the rules. Invisible, which you produced with uh, Condé Nast and directed, um, the reviews were uh, highly favorable, but talked about how, though, you didn't follow those rules. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I, 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 I am, you know, as by nature, a, a rule breaker. Uh, but, you know, starting invisible, there really, there were no rules. I mean, there were some rules that were extremely conservative, almost like a lawyer drafted them. <laughs> and uh, there was, that's, you know, there was no, gonna be no future for VR if, if you did that. So we, uh, we assembled really an amazing team. I was just one of, of, of many directors, um, including Juliana Tatlock, who's up here, who, uh, one of the producers and director, and, and we, we had some young film students uh, directing. We had, you know, really um, a lot of very smart minds who were uh, all thinking, all challenging each other to think outside the box. Um, and really, our only rule was whatever worked. Whatever worked and didn't make you sick. But, you know, because a lot of VR, scripted VR, kind of is like watching like a bad video of like a play. Yeah. Right, like you're less involved. It's just it's way over there. Yeah. Um, and so that, I like being in a situation where you have no choice but to break a rule. What is it about the script that you felt I could tell this story better in VR than I would maybe an HBO movie, or did you feel that way? Um, no, we we Melissa Wallach and I were starting to develop Invisible and and. Really early on, we're like, are we going to do this as a TV show, as a movie? And, uh, and we, I actually, I had been starting, maybe my aha moment, because I was starting to really become enthralled with the possibility of VR, just its potential. I thought, you know, this, this is the kind of show that, that could make sense in VR. And um, I was excited about developing the project from scratch for VR and thinking about uh, how, how the medium would affect uh, what kind of story you tell and how you tell the story. Um, and we didn't, there were no rules about it. What I mean, kind we of were, you know, and it, maybe my, you know, my style in, in Hollywood is, you know, sometimes gets sort of disparaging write-ups in the press because it can be a little chaotic because um, I'm constantly pushing the boundaries and reworking my scripts and and, uh, and reshooting things to see if I could do it better. And you know, when it came to Invisible, really, that's that's you. Those are the exact qualities you, you need because, you know, your first attempt, you know, some things just aren't going to work, right? It's not like you can, you know, in Hollywood, maybe they want you to point to an existing movie and say copy that. And, uh, and when you don't want to copy something and try to do something original, that's where you know, sometimes things work, sometimes they don't. Uh, and you know, I'm just committed to staying at it till we make it work. You were quoted as saying, we are going to have to work harder in VR than we ever had to in 2D to make the audience hungry because they are going to have to search the frame to find their story. Yeah, and we, that's something I didn't say before we started shooting Invisible. That's something that I, I thought of while we were shooting Invisible, as we, like swingers, where you shoot some stuff and you, you're either pleasantly surprised or disappointed when you see the footage. The key thing is you have to react. You can't like bury your head in the, in the sand and go, well, that's not working, but I'm just gonna keep doing the same thing. So, uh, you know, I had a, amazing uh, collaborators on Invisible where we were our toughest critics on ourselves, and you know, like we even, you know, a sh shortly into starting Invisible, we actually shut down because we said we're learning some things here that require us to even shift how we're shooting it. Because um, some we had brought some of our, our Hollywood techniques to Invisible that worked fine in 2D, and suddenly we're realizing these we have to really rethink how we're shooting this. Um, and then the other thing that I was starting to discover is because in 360 VR, and we should also talk about 180 VR because our, our company, 30 Ninjas, is, is now um, starting to work in 180. But in 360, um, the thing I discovered 
you know, in the process of making invisible is that like, you know, in a cut, you could be looking at the wrong direction. And because we did want to introduce, you know, a fair amount of editing, the, you, the audience had to actually be hungry to find the story because they might be looking in the wrong direction. And that required from Melissa a level of writing that was more engaging and more quickly engaging um, that I've had to do in my TV shows or, or my films. What kinds of techniques did you use to get the audience's attention where you were wanting to draw it? I mean, there's a lot of like just sort of gimmicks or mechanical techniques like sounds and, and um, a, you know, designing shots so you kind of know where someone's going to be looking on, on the outcut so you know where they'll be looking when the next shot begins. But the thing that's, that's a real bitch in, in VR um, is that, especially in 360, is the audience can choose to look any direction. And in, in regular 2D films, you know, part of our editing is we're cutting out the really bad stuff. You know, it's, it's oh, that's a bad performance. I don't like what that extra's doing. Even, you know, one of your movie stars isn't doing something so good. Let's, let's use a single of the other person. And let's just not cut, because they never got that moment working. But in VR, the audience might choose to look at your, your most unimpressive thing in the frame. So you, you have to sort of, you have to assume for the worst. And uh, that's, that was really, that, that may have been the most challenging part of Invisible was, was to, to make sure that every piece of, of the frame, because we really, we wanted to take advantage of 360. We didn't want to shoot in 360, but the only interesting thing is here, and it's just like nothing happening there. We had storylines and things happening all around you. So like something like Sleep No More, no matter which way you look, you're getting story. Um, but, and we had to come up with some techniques of how to stitch and combine performances from different takes. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, what's amazing about the team at 30 Ninjas is that we, there's people who are incredibly technically savvy and, and, you know, sort of the best in the business when it comes to VR technically. And then there's a lot of people creatively, um, in storytelling and that we're all sort of pushing each other. Um, and coming up with ways to do edits or how to stitch things and, and deal with some of the problems I'm talking about. When I think of your movies, uh, it occurs to me uh, personally that they are just as satisfying the second, third, or fourth time you see them on HBO. VR seems to demand this sense of saying, okay, you can watch it once, uh, but you can watch it twice or three times and see something you did in the first time. Is that an aesthetic or a thought process that you bring from your background? Yeah. Very, very much so. I mean, I, I really do try to design my films for multiple viewings and, and try to, you know, when we, when we build sets for, to save money, we maybe build a set that's just like two feet bigger than what the frame is. You know, if the camera just panned a little bit further over, not in VR obviously, but in 2D, you would see that we only built exactly what we needed. And if the camera wasn't going to see the ceiling, we don't bother building the ceiling. And you figure that all out in advance. When it comes to sort of the story, I like to build the whole world out. And, and, and then it affects the teeny little details. It affects the extras in the scene. It affects the props. It affects uh, the, the production design to have really thought out all aspects of the world. So Born Identity, you know, for instance, I mean, there's a, there's a very complex storyline happening about the CIA's involvement in Africa and propping up a dictator who's over, who we eventually stop supporting, and he's in exile in Paris. And there's, you know, m no one's paying any attention to that. It's, it's there. Like, if I told you that, you could go back and look at Born Identity and be like, oh, the, all of those beats are there. But what it does is it means when you go see the film a second, third, fourth time, there's more story there. Um, and even just in how it's affecting, you know, our, our main heroes. It's not just more story and it's over there. The understanding the whole world changes all the details of, of how your, your main characters are interacting. And what's so exciting for me about VR, and, you know, and I really was inspired in part by things like Sleep No More, is that when you're watching Invisible, you know, if you're looking this direction versus that direction, you're going to get slightly different story. And it all works. It's all designed so that if you 
you know, if there's something you absolutely need to know, we make sure there's no way you can miss it. But we also like just the idea, like in my movies, that there's stuff maybe you won't pick up the first time because you're paying attention to this over here, but the movie still works. And then when you watch it a second time, you're like, oh, there's something else was happening I never even realized. And even when you see my film Go, which is done from three different points of view, um, you know, it's like it's half an hour of a movie from one point of view, and then like Rashomon, it resets, and you see the same story from a different character's point of view. And that movie, when you watch it a second or third or fourth time, you're, you're suddenly seeing things you didn't realize because you're seeing the same scene from a different perspective. And when you're watching, when you watch the film the second time, you know things about that first scene that weren't even in the first scene. They were in an, an hour later in the movie, um, almost like watching a magic trick the second time. And so uh, that really was, and, and I love the experience people have watching Go, and that in fact, it's a totally different movie the second time you see it, but just as enjoyable. And I feel like Invisible, you, there's many different experiences you can have watching it, because there's so many great characters, and you get different moments from them depending which way you're looking. When, when people compare um, uh, VR, they logically compare it to movies, they compare it to, to video games. Video games, something you can play for hundreds of hours and always have a different experience. Motion pictures, maybe you see something the second or third or fourth. How would you characterize VR? How would you describe you it? You know, VR is its own, it's its own beast. It, it's, it's its own art form. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it clearly has a huge future. I mean, if you walk around the conference here and try, you know, the, the you know, we, we go to movies or we watch TV to get immersed in another world. It's, it's, it's why, you know, superhero films, you know, and Marvel films do so well, because, you know, we get to not think about, like, the problems in our own lives or what's going on in America or in the world. You, you get to go be in an alternate reality. And, and VR is like the ultimate escape from our, our present reality. You're, you're always taking on these new challenges. And so when we hear VR is very, very difficult, does that, does that even enter into your thinking? Or do you think of this as just another creative challenge, just like if I were going to make a, another movie? Uh, I mean, really great movies tackle like creative challenges and technical challenges. Right, it's so, uh, I think there's no reason why VR isn't following that same formula. And, and very much at, at 30 Ninjas, we're like, a lot of times, you know, we'll, like Lewis Smithingham, who's sitting there, who's, who's brilliant in, in the sort of, in many aspects of VR, but specifically about how to shoot it so that you're, you know, it actually technically works. And, He'll be like, you can't, you know, we'll just think of doing things and be like, that can't be done, that can't be done. We're like, okay, well, stay out of it for a moment. Let us come up with what we wanted to do, and then you figure out how it can be happen. And then at the same time, Lewis might be like, oh my God, I discovered here's something really cool you could do that no one's done. And then that trickles into, oh, we could tell a story a different way because of that. So I, I do think, uh, even in a more exciting way than than film, although I'm, you know, I'm doing a big visual effects film now, so it, it is sort of operating in the same way of like, what's possible? Like sometimes the creative is driving the technical, and sometimes the technical is driving the creative. And it's, I, I just, I love working in that environment. And VR is so, there's so many opportunities for these two sides to sort of clash and collaborate. What do you think about 180? Well, you know, Google's uh, introducing uh, uh, 180 VR instead of 360, and, and we're actually, uh, we have a piece we just did with, with Google, um, I think that started up today. And, and um, you know, I, when we were doing Invisible, I was drawn to possibly doing some of the scenes in 180, um, just because sometimes you're like, the audience doesn't need to necessarily, they don't need to look 360. Um, but I also think 180 is a, uh, you know, because the main issue with VR is we're, we're all creating content. There's a really great people working, at creating content. And the assumption is, you know, you create, you know, that must-see thing. And that's where the audience will finally, you know, the masses will finally start uh, getting, you know, VR gear, you know. And we'll know we've really arrived. And, you know, I watched my mother put one on. Right. Um, but, you know, it may be that 180, and obviously Google is incredibly smart. You know, and so 
they may know, they, that may be a clever way of sort of reducing sort of the bandwidth and the sort of barrier to entry and get people sort of comfortable with 180 and then suddenly expand to 220 and as the internet gets better, you know, the, the, the speeds get better for delivery and, and slowly keep working out and eventually we'll be back at 360. But uh, so I think 180 uh, has a lot of potential. On a, on a set when you're shooting something, uh, does it feel like a movie set in that you've got a lot of the same people or the same functions? Is it a smaller group? I uh, love that it's like smaller. It? Like that's, that is my goal in my movies. It's like, why can't it be smaller? Like, I don't understand why there are all these people there. And, when and <laughs> VR, you can't have them, because they get in the shot. You honestly, like, there's, th there's no room for them. So I, I love, because the thing about movies is you're like, you're looking this direction, you want to swing around, and there's like 50 people there that got to move out of the way. So I actually, I have a rule on my sets that there's no video village and no, no chairs. Because it drives me nuts, These, this, like a whole tent village sets up just outside of your frame, and then you want to move. It's like, it's, this caravan's got to move out of the way. So VR, they, don't, they never set up in the first place. And what does a small crew deliver for you uh, when you're making Flexibility. The, like, to be able to go with the moment. Something's happening, and, uh, you know, I'm just, I, and, and I don't know, I just, I, 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 I'm still back in the sort of, you know, swinger stage where it was like we, like everybody on the set was doing seven jobs and, and you, you know, you're all, I like, I just like the camaraderie of a small team working really hard. So, but you're looking for good writers who know the craft that you can bring in or is writing for VR different? Uh, I'm definitely looking just for great writers and, and it's, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care what genre they write in. I mean, Tony Gilroy, who I brought in on Born Identity, was done Dolores Claiborne. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in people who, who are good storytellers and great with character. I didn't realize on Invisible how important character writing was going to be, because um, I didn't understand right from the beginning that, unlike a film, you can sort of, a 2D film, you can manipulate an audience into caring about somebody, because you really can control their experience. In VR, you know, you, the audience, the, the, ca the performance and the writing have to be such that the audience automatically cares about a character and wants to follow them. So uh, the writing challenge for Melissa was, was it was great that we, we had somebody who was an Oscar level writer. How will you, you're starting a new motion picture project. Uh, do you want to continue to try to be making a movie in VR, or can you only focus on one thing at one time? How do you see your life? If you look at career and you think of what you want to do, how do you map out the next five years as far as the balance between making uh, big, big movies and, and making uh, VR? Um, well, I'm not married, so, and I don't have kids, so I feel like I can do both, and I have been doing both. You know, while we were doing Invisible, I was, shooting American Made with Tom Cruise, which comes out this fall, and prepping uh, two movies. Uh, so it's not, I don't, I don't feel like, you know, I'm starting this movie Chaos Walking and, and at 30 Ninjas, we're, we're aggressively uh, developing some new um, scripted VR um, ideas. Because uh, again, not only do I want to learn you know, while we're making Invisible, and so we're better at it at the end than at the beginning. But when we finish, I want to look back at it and then apply everything I learned to, to make big leaps forward. You know, it's when I was making uh, Born Identity, uh, you know, and I'd come off of doing two little independent movies, uh, and I, Stacy Snyder was running Universal at the time, we had a lot of friction. I had fights with the producers because I was breaking too many rules. And she was like, you know, this is, you know, it didn't look like a spy film. It didn't look like what they thought it was going to look like. And she was like, you know, this isn't your $50 million film school. And at the time, I was sort of insecure about it. And afterwards, I was like, you know, actually, it, is, it was my $50 million film school. <laughs> like, you're crazy if you think after I did two independent films that I knew how to make Born Identity on day one. 
The key was by the time I finished making it, I knew how to make it. And so I feel like within VR, it's, it's an environment where it's not even assumed that anybody knows exactly what they're doing going in because it's so nascent. Uh, you, more than most, are aware of the global impact that motion picture has. And Steven Spielberg's next movie is Ready Player One. And uh, it comes out March, I think right now, March 18th from Warner Brothers. Do you think that could be, that could do for VR, uh, what maybe Avatar did for 3D movies? Uh, uh, help push this so that the people in this room, all of us working in VR, will have uh, a little wind at our back because of the, of the awareness that his movie may bring to this? Um, it definitely could be a, you know, a positive influence. You know, movies are incredibly influential, but I, I, I think ultimately the key is gonna be the, the must-see th thing in VR. When, when, when a piece in VR crosses over to the point where it's the water cooler thing that you have to see this, and suddenly you can't be part of like the, the national conversation if you haven't seen it, that, that's, that's the tipping point. And do you see that as something that we're likely to see with all the people working on it and actually throwing some money at it? You sense that's something we'll see in six months or a year as opposed to five years? I, I would say it's probably somewhere between one year and five years. Okay, so thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. And good luck and congratulations. Thank, thank you, you, Doug Lyman. Thank you. A Close Up is produced by the Advanced Imaging and VR Societies in Hollywood and is powered by Barco.